I want to begin by inviting you to look at the hymn, the gospel song that I've included with the Bible study notes today. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. The needy part gets me as well as the sinner part in these days of quarantine where we are isolated. Some of us may be sick. There's financial pressures. And frankly, we're lonely. We're discouraged. These are hard days. We have the opportunity to identify with Joseph the very one we're studying in Scripture, and all that he learned at Pitt State University. But look at these words from this old gospel song. I wish we had Danny with us to sing with the piano. I wish we could try singing together. But come, you're invited. Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. Look at the next verse. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. I love that line. And then the last verse. Let not conscience make you linger. Our subject tonight is what do you do with a guilty conscience? Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. Wish I could write poetry like that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that the only requirement that you demand in coming to you for help is our neediness, our sinfulness, our bankruptcy, our need. So, Father, we come poor and needy, weak and ruined by the fall, and thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus for people just like us. Speak to us tonight through your word and through the life of Joseph. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You have your notes in front of you, I trust. We're almost at the end of Genesis, not just the life of Joseph, but the book of Genesis. I think there will be two more sessions after tonight. I'm still organizing the final two lessons. But let's dig in to chapters 42, 43, 44, and at least we're going to get a hint at chapter 45. It's a large passage of scripture, but let's begin this way. The story of Joseph up to this point has focused mainly on events in Egypt, Potiphar's house, the prison, Pharaoh's palace, But in Genesis 42, where it begins tonight, the scene suddenly shifts and we're taken back to Canaan. Remember in the Western movies, meanwhile, back at the ranch, oh yeah, it's all about Jacob and Canaan and the covenant promise. It's not about Egypt, but we're taken back to Canaan where Jacob and his 11 sons are trying to survive a famine. The famine is the immediate issue, but there are other far more serious obstacles than the famine. There are things that are greater threats to the work of God in the world than famine. Famine's important that are threatening to derail God's plan of redemption for the world. This reorients us to the big story that God is writing. It's not really about Egypt. It's about Canaan. It's not about Pharaoh and his family. It's about Jacob and his family. That's where the big story God is writing. So here are the obstacles to God's work in the world that we are introduced to 
in Genesis 42. First, A, there is a famine in the land of promise. Think about that. The land of promise, the place where God has prepared for you. Later, it'll be called a place of milk and honey. There's famine there. There are at least two theological issues that this raises. One, what do you do when the promised land resembles Death Valley? That'll put a kink in your theology right there. Isn't Canaan to be a place of milk and honey in abundance? Why does Egypt seem to be more blessed than Canaan? That's one of the issues that we're needing to wrestle with. God himself will eventually tell Jacob in chapter 46, it's okay, Jacob, take your family and move away from the land of promise that I've sworn to give you and move to Egypt. So that's one issue. A second theological question is, but when Israel, the people of God, get to Egypt, can Israel survive in Egypt? Will God's people be able to maintain their covenant identity? Or will they be assimilated? Very important word, assimilation. Will the people of God, the covenant people, be assimilated by Egyptian beauty and culture and wealth and heritage? Will they lose their identity in Egyptian ways and thinking? Note, Jacob's decision to move the family to Egypt opens a period of, anybody remember how many years the people of God will spend in Egypt? Four hundred. It was 400 years ago the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. That's a long time. Over that period of time, living in Egypt, being part of Egyptian culture, won't they lose their identity? What a great question. Letter B. A second obstacle threatening to derail God's plan is not just famine in the land, but a more Serious issue is there is division in the family. The covenant family has experienced cruelty, abuse, lies, and deceptions. They've sold a son into slavery. They've sold a brother into slavery. And the wounds are so deep and so wide, and the division is so great, it nullifies the covenant promises both to the people and through the people. There's division in the family. So the theological question is, can this division be mended? I'm so glad you asked. Can the brokenness be healed? Is, here's the blank, big word, reconciliation. Is it even possible? And if it is possible for Joseph and his brothers to be reconciled, how? How does it occur? That's one of the great questions we'll be looking at in our lesson today. What is reconciliation and how does it happen? A third obstacle that's threatening to derail God's work in the world not just famine, not just division in the family, but see, where is the promised seed? Do you remember the seed, the seed of the woman? If you've been with us through the book of Genesis, you'll remember I introduced you at the second or third lesson to Genesis 3, verse 15. It's the first announcement of the gospel in the Bible where God, speaking to the serpent, says, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between her seed 
and your seed. He, meaning the seed of the woman, will bruise your head. He'll crush your head. And you and your seed will bruise his heel. So there's this announcement from the very beginning that the seed of the woman will one day crush the serpent and reestablish God's kingdom reality and Eden in the world. So the question is, where is the promised seed? We're going to see it tonight in our study. Genesis carefully traces the, the blank there is transmission of this seed. The seed goes from Eve, and then it goes through her descendants all the way to a manger in Bethlehem. But where is that seed? Where's the transmission? of this promised seed that will one day come to redeem us and shows us, and shows, excuse me, Genesis traces the transmission of this promised seed that will one day come to redeem us. And Genesis shows how the choice of the seed bearer is consistently surprising. Who's carrying the seed? Is it Cain? No, it's not Cain, it's Seth. Of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which one is it? Well, it's Shem and the Semites. Then Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Which one carries the seed? Well, it's not Ishmael, it's Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Is it Esau or is it Jacob? You remember these stories, and the book of Genesis is at pains to help us understand where the seed is and who is carrying the lineage that will bring us to the serpent crusher, the one who crushes the head of the serpent. But when you come to our story tonight, you've got Jacob and 12 sons. Now, which one of those 12 has the seed? Is it the firstborn Reuben? Well, he slept with his father's concubine and got disqualified. Is it the secondborn, sort of like the vice president? Is it Simeon? No, Simeon's a murderer. He helped with his brother Levi to murder the town of Shechem. Well, maybe it's Joseph. Surely it's Joseph. He's the good boy. Isn't he the star? Isn't he carrying the seed? Isn't it interesting that Joseph is not the seed bearer? The Messiah does not come through Joseph. So the question is, who is it? Who is the father of David? Who is the father of Jesus? The seed, the ultimate seed, the one who will come and crush the serpent. Stay tuned. Drama in four acts. I'm at Roman numeral two. We don't have time tonight to read all four chapters, but let me just summarize this way. I want to encourage you to read it. Maybe some of you have read it even before the lesson, but let me summarize the story in four acts. Act one, Joseph's brothers and their first trip to Egypt. Jacob sends 10 sons to Egypt to buy bread, where they bow before Joseph. And the text emphasizes this is the fulfillment, isn't it, of Joseph's dream. But if you remember in Joseph's dream, I've got it in the footnote, when Joseph dreamed about the stars and the sun and the moon bowing before him, in his dream, he specifically saw 11 stars bowing to him, but in chapter 42, there's only 10. So Joseph knows the dream's not quite reached its fulfillment yet. But speaking through an interpreter, Joseph recognizes his brothers. They do not recognize Joseph, not in their wildest imagination. Can they picture this Egyptian-speaking, clean-shaven, majestic prince who they haven't 
seeing their brother in 22 years, they assume he's dead, but this is their brother. Joseph treats them roughly, accuses them of being spies. They respond, here's the blank, we are honest men. Really? We'll see. To test their honesty, Joseph demands they return with their younger brother, and he keeps Simeon as a hostage. He puts their money back in their sacks, and when they get home, Jacob is grieved that they've come home without one of their brothers. That's not the first time the brothers came home, minus a brother. Reuben makes a noble but stupid promise saying, Daddy, I'll bring Simeon home, and if I don't, you can kill two of my children. What kind of logic is that? I don't have time to talk about that. The question at work here, what do you imagine Joseph's emotions must have been when he saw his brothers, whom he had not seen in 22 years? I wish I had time right now to break us up into small groups and say, go talk about this. Was Joseph joyful to see people he hadn't seen in 22 years? Was he sad because they were experiencing famine? Was he angry at them? Did he see them and he just sort of seethed with anger? Was he looking for revenge? Or maybe was he conflicted? He didn't know what, to, should I love them? Should I tell them who I am? Should I embrace them? Or should I call the guards and have them executed on the spot? Act number two, Genesis chapter 43. They make a second trip. Famine is still going on. They've consumed all their resources that they bought from the first trip to Canaan. And Jacob finally consents to let Benjamin go on a second trip for food. Judah, there's the blank. Keep your eye on Judah. I'm giving you a hint. Judah offers himself as a pledge for Benjamin's safety. The last time he gave a pledge was to Tamar, and he gave a pledge of his staff, his walking staff. That's one kind of pledge, but here Judah says, no, I'm going to give not my staff as a pledge, but my very life. Joseph invites them when they get to Egypt into his house, and they have a feast together. And it's interesting how the text says the Egyptians sat at one table, the Hebrews, the brothers, sat at another table because Egyptians and Hebrews don't mix, and Joseph sat by himself at a third table. I don't think you could have a more graphic picture of the dilemma in which Joseph finds himself. He's having an identity crisis. Am I Egyptian or am I Hebrew? Who am I? Wonderful and dramatic how the story is played out. Joseph seats his brother in their birth order. Wow, 11 brothers in order. I've got a footnote there. One of the commentators I read did the math on this and said the probability is one in 40 million chances <laughs> that you could take 11 men and sit them in their birth order. And when the brothers realized the order in which they had been seated, they were amazed. What's going on here? Act number three, we get to chapter 44. Joseph devises a plan to test his brothers. Joseph seems conflicted. That's actually one of my new favorite words in life, conflicted. He's feeling these emotions that are polar opposites. I love my brothers, but I hate my brothers. I want to embrace my brothers, but I want revenge on my brothers. How do I work it out? Does he want reconciliation or revenge? Why doesn't he reveal his identity? What is he waiting for? 
I'm so glad you asked. He devises a test. This is what he's waiting for. To see if his brothers have truly repented of their evil past. Will they treat Benjamin, Joseph's full brother, as they treated him 22 years ago? This is how he'll know if they've really changed. So he hides his silver chalice in Benjamin's sack. You remember the story. And he sets the trap. He accuses Benjamin of theft, plans to lock him up. And that becomes the occasion for Judah and his finest hour. He steps forward and makes a dramatic plea, one of the greatest speeches in the Bible, for Benjamin's relief, and he offers himself as a substitute. Write that word down, substitute, in the blank. It's a very important word in Scripture. When we talk about the substitutionary atonement, it means God has provided a substitute so that we can go free and someone else bears the penalty. Judah's speech is a masterpiece of theological wisdom, emotional honesty, and persuasive rhetoric. I debated just talking about his speech tonight. You can go back and read it and reread it. And it sets Judah apart as the obvious leader of the family. It's not going to be Reuben or Simeon. It's not even going to be Joseph, who's the leader of the clan. It's Judah. His willingness to give his life so that Benjamin might live shows that he understands the ways of God. Judah is clearly God's choice to lead the seed project. I love that phrase, seed project. I got that from John Lennox and his work on Joseph. You can see the footnote. The seed of the serpent crusher is not in Reuben. It's not in Joseph. It's in Judah. He will become the father of David. He will become the father of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Judah's mother named him well. His name means praise the Lord. And finally, the fourth act comes in chapter 45, which we're going to look at next week. Don't miss it. Judah's speech is so effective when he gives the benediction, Joseph, who they've been speaking to through an interpreter the whole time, suddenly bursts into tears. One of the most moving emotional moments in Scripture as Joseph begins to sob and to sob so loudly, all the Egyptians in the neighborhood hear the prime minister sobbing. Joseph sends the Egyptians out of the house and he says to his brothers in Hebrew, I'm Joseph, your brother. Do I still have a father? Beautiful, beautiful story. Judah's speech is effective, bursting with emotion. Joseph finally reveals the truth. I'm Joseph. Though full reconciliation will take time, the division in the family has been addressed and healing of that division in the covenant family. It's why Jesus' final prayer in John 17 is, Father, make them one, because if my church is not one, the world will not know that you sent me. They have to be united. Divisions must be healed. It can happen. Next week, we'll focus on how forgiveness is the key element to bringing divided parties together. Okay, let's take the time we have left and try to map out the path of reconciliation. I don't want to call them steps, 
But I do want to say there are certain elements that are indispensable if reconciliation, if the division is healed and reconciliation becomes possible. Follow with me in the notes. Before the Bible offers a theological definition of a doctrine, often it paints a picture. That's what we have in Genesis with the Joseph story is a picture, not an abstract theological statement about reconciliation, but a picture, a dramatic picture of what it looks like. This story, in this story, we have a beautiful illustration of the doctrine of reconciliation. To reconcile means to restore friendly relations. Those who were enemies become friends. Now, whether we are enemies vertically with God or horizontally with one another, reconciliation bridges the gap. It causes to coexist in harmony, to be compatible, to settle an agreement, to make one account consistent with another account. When I reconcile my checking account with the bank's statement that comes every month, I must make those two accounts match up because if they don't reconcile, then I have an irreconcilable difference with the bank. Incidentally, the bank is always right. But God wants us to get our accounts in agreement. For Paul, this is the doctrine that explains both our relationship to God and our ministry to others. This is how I relate to God because I've been reconciled and he sends me as a minister of reconciliation into the world. Listen to how he says it in 2 Corinthians. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, Christ making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And we could add, and be reconciled to one another. The story of how Joseph and his brothers made things right shows us the indispensable ingredients of how enmity where enemies is dissolved, how wounds are healed. Think of the wounds that Joseph bore from his brothers who trafficked him, sold him as a slave, and how unity is restored. Whether the division is vertical between us and God, or whether the division is horizontal between us and someone else, the steps are the same. I'm going to share with you in this study five steps, five ingredients of reconciliation from the Joseph story. We're only going to really talk about four because next week we're going to talk about the fifth one for the whole time. Let's dive in. The first essential ingredient for reconciliation to happen is guilt. Somebody has to feel the guilt. They have to feel the conviction of sin that something is broken, something is wrong. I reread again this week Edgar Allan Poe's short story, hardly a Christian text, but his short story that I was introduced to in high school, I never liked English literature in high school, but this story got my attention. It was called The Telltale Heart. Remember the story? Let me tell you how it goes. It goes like this. A man, it happens to be the narrator of the story, murdered a next door neighbor. 
He was an old man, spent most of the day in bed, but during the night, for some crazy reason, the neighbor murdered him, smothered him with the pillow, and as he smothered him, he heard the beating heart of the man he was killing. Then he dismembered the body and hid it in the planks of the floor. The next day, police came to investigate a missing person, and the neighbor was so confident that he had committed the perfect crime, he showed the policeman into the apartment, sat down, put his chair over the very planks in the floor where the body lay, and talked to the policeman about the missing person. But during the conversation, the narrator says, I began to hear a thumping, the thump the thump. It was the beating of the heart. It grew so loud, he couldn't understand why the police couldn't hear the beating heart. And finally, the story closes with these words, and I quote Edgar Allan Poe. Suddenly, I could bear it no longer. I pointed at the boards in the floor and cried, yes, I killed him. Pull up the boards and you'll see. I killed him. But why does his heart not stop beating? Why does it not stop? Edgar Allan Poe's story is about the power of a guilty conscience. That's the blank there. A guilty conscience. The story underscores the biblical teaching that lies and cover up cannot erase the torment of a guilty conscience. Time does not heal all wounds. It's a lie. Time does not make the sin go away. The pain of conscience is often worse than the punishment. That's what Poe's story is underscoring. I'd rather go to prison for this crime than live with the torment of my conscience. This is what the Bible says in Numbers 32. Be sure your sin will find you out. Or in Psalm chapter 9, verse 12, the Lord does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Back to Joseph. It's been 22 years. 22 years. The brothers thought they had committed a perfect crime. They had made their brother go away. It looked like a wild animal killed him. Nobody suspected. Joseph's brothers have committed a perfect crime. 22 years have passed. No one will ever know. But God has arranged circumstances to force them to confront their past. It's an amazing story. Listen to some of the verses where we realize that the brothers are still feeling guilt for what they'd done. The first trip to Egypt, they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. We saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we didn't listen. That's why all this craziness is happening to us in Egypt. We're being paid back. The next bullet, Reuben said, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Meaning Joseph. You didn't listen. So now there comes a reckoning of his blood. When one brother finds his money in his sack after the, the first visit to Egypt, they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done? And then when Judah gives his final speech, he says to Joseph, unbeknownst to him, his brother, What shall we speak? How can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. And even though we didn't steal the silver cup, we're still guilty. 
You see, a guilty conscience is like that light on the dashboard of your car. In my car, it's red, and it says, check engine, and there's a little picture of an engine. When that light comes on, it can ruin your whole day. Oh, my goodness. But often when that light comes on, the car's still running. Smoke's not coming out of the hood. Why can't I just ignore the light and keep on with my routine? Now that's what a guilty conscience is. It's a red light on the dashboard of your life that lets you know you better stop, you better check what's under the hood. Because if you don't, things will be much worse than if you do. Number three, there can be no true reconciliation until there is conviction of sin. It's a word I hear very seldom in the church anymore. Conviction of sin. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. This is the ministry of the Pentecostal spirit. When the spirit is moving, people are suddenly keenly aware of the red light on the dashboard that says something's wrong. But Lord, it happened 22 years ago. Something's wrong. Stop the car, open the hood, call in the experts and figure it out. Theological lesson, sin does not disappear. Time does not heal all wounds. So what do you do with a guilty conscience? I'm so glad you asked. That's one of the questions Scripture wants us to ask. What do you do when you become aware suddenly you're confronted with something in your past or your present that's not right? What do you do with a guilty conscience? This leads us to the second element of reconciliation, confession. It's not enough just to be guilty to have bad feelings, the Bible calls us to confess the truth about our sin. The Greek word for confess literally means to say the same thing or to agree. It's when God says something is wrong, if I confess, I say, God, I agree. Rather than trying, I've given you several blanks because I want to talk about these words. Rather than trying to deny our sin or rationalize our sin, third blank, or justify our sin, next blank, or blame someone else for our sin, or finally, suppress our sin. I think the brothers had lived for 22 years mainly trying to suppress their sin. Let's just pretend it's not there. Let's just turn the music up louder. Let's work longer hours. Let's make ourselves busy so we don't have to think about what we did. But whether you deny your sin, rationalize your sin, I'd love to talk about each of these and give illustrations for each of these dysfunctional ways to deal with guilt. They don't work. Reminds me of the story of a man who couldn't sleep at night because of a guilty conscience because he had cheated on his income tax. So finally, he wrote a letter to the IRS that said this, Dear Sir, I have been unable to sleep because last year when I filled out my income tax, I deliberately misrepresented my income. I'm enclosing a check for $500. If I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest of what I owe. <laughs> That's not how confession is to be done. Confession is when we simply say, I agree with God and his assessment, his assessment of my actions, 
and my attitudes. It was sin. I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I have no excuse. I take responsibility. That's what confession means. Listen to how David expresses confession in Psalm 32. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will, there it is, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Martin Luther said it this way, there are two kinds of sin. One is confessed, and this one, no one should leave unforgiven. The other kind of sin is defended, and this one, no one can forgive because it refuses to be counted as sin and to accept forgiveness. This is what it means to deny sin, rationalize sin, justify sin, blame our behavior on somebody else, play the victim, suppress our sin. The Bible says, just confess the truth. Sounds so simple and yet so difficult to do. Number four, confession has both a private and a public aspect. To be effective, James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another. To be effective, confession should be succinct. Confession shouldn't take four pages of single typed pages. When it's done rightly, it takes about one sentence. Succinct, specific, not vague and generic, but specific in particular, and emotionally honest. Imagine if Joseph's brothers had said to him, now Joseph, if, if we hurt you by what we did, that's emotionally dishonest. If you hurt him by selling him as a slave into Egypt, of course you hurt him. Be emotionally honest in your confession. God's promise is that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, in some of the hymns we sing in church, some of the newer translations of those hymns have omitted what is considered by some today offensive language. For example, the hymn, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for what? The newer translations say, for sinners such as I, but the original says, for such a worm as I. Now, you may not appreciate my theology on this, but I like the word worm. I understand the importance for self-esteem and all of that. But when we recognize the depth of the depravity of our sin and the reality of what worms and wretched sinners we are, and when we put words on that, then we become candidates for reconciliation. When we don't confess the truth, reconciliation remains impossible. Theological lesson, but confession alone, though helpful, can never heal a broken relationship. I can tell you I'm a jerk, and that might be true, but that doesn't reconcile us alone. It's an important piece. Forgiveness is not synonymous with reconciliation. 
I can even forgive you for being a jerk, but that doesn't restore the relationship. In many instances, the one who confesses is not so much apologizing for a moral wrong or the pain he or she has caused. He's simply sorry he got caught. This leads to the next essential element for reconciliation. Letter C, repentance. Repentance means more than feeling remorse. If you remember your scriptures, after Judas betrayed Jesus and sold him for 30 pieces of silver, he felt terrible. He felt great remorse. In fact, he felt so bad about it, he committed suicide. But that didn't restore him to God. Just feeling bad or even confessing how bad he felt. What was missing in Judas's life was repentance. The Greek word means change of mind, metanoia. That word noia refers to the mind. Repentance means a change of heart, a change of ways, more than feeling badly about our sins. Repentance means that we have renounced them and turned from them. The test Joseph devised concerning the silver goblet in Benjamin's sack revealed that the brothers had indeed changed. Rather than abandoning Benjamin as they had Joseph, they stood in solidarity. When the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, the brothers could have said, that's your problem, Ben, we're headed home. You'll have to deal with that yourself. But in solidarity, they stood together. The theological lesson here is that the Bible is clear that repentance is indispensable to reconciliation. Unless you repent, you will perish. That leads us to a fourth element. We've seen there must be guilt. There must be confession. There must be repentance. Now here's the big one, and this is where Judah, the seed bearer, steps in. There must be substitution. In offering himself as a guarantee for Benjamin's well-being, Judah illustrates the principle of substitution. Someone takes the punishment and even death for someone else. One dies so another can live. This only works when it is freely offered. No one was making Judah be a substitute. This came from his own being. This is something I choose to do. I want to do it for my brother and for my father. Freely offered by the Redeemer, and it's motivated by love. Number two, something must be done about sin. It cannot be lightly dismissed. You see, what the brothers did to Joseph can't just be swept under the carpet. You can't just pretend that didn't happen. And to forgive them, come back next week, doesn't mean that I say, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about that you trafficked me. No, sin demands payment. It can't be lightly dismissed as if, don't worry about it. It was nothing. It was something. A price must be paid if reconciliation is to occur. That's so important, I'm going to say it again. A price must be paid if reconciliation is to occur. Salvation may be free, but it's not cheap. Listen to these verses. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Who dies? Well, 
Death is demanded where there's sin. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, in a just universe, the scales must balance. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Or Romans 6.23, you can't get more succinct and powerful than this. The wages of sin is death. Number three, the basic way this principle works is through substitution. The price for sin is paid, but by a substitute. It's not the sinner who pays the price. It's someone who offers themselves to pay the price as a substitute for the sinner. This was graphically portrayed in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement especially in the ritual with the scapegoat. You can read about this in Leviticus chapter 16, but here's the heart of it. During the ceremony on the day of atonement, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat. This is the scapegoat. And confess, see the words? Confess over the goat all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. Can you imagine how dramatic that would have been in a public ceremony as the high priest put his hands on a goat and started naming the sins of the people in the congregation? I mean, naming their sins. Lord, on this goat, I'm going to put adultery. I'm going to put drunkenness. I'm going to put fornication. I'm going to put homosexual behaviors. All the sins of the nations were placed on that goat, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness, and the goat shall bear, B-E-A-R, all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. Can you imagine the shouts of joy that must have gone up, up as the congregation saw the scapegoat wandering off into the wilderness, never to be seen again? Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. He's taken my sins away, and in my heart he's put a song. I sing that in Vacation Bible School, and it's a great theological lesson of substitutionary atonement. Number four, in an ultimate manner, Jesus bore the sins of the world on the cross. That's what happened on the cross when Jesus became a substitute for sinners like me, for sinners like you. He freely chose to take on himself the penalty our sins deserve. He died in my place. This is how Isaiah expresses it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried. Do you hear the, the words? He's carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. There is no reconciliation without a substitute. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on the divine scapegoat. We call him a lamb but he's also a scapegoat. He took all your sins and mine and put them on Jesus. Jesus paid the debt. Jesus died the death those sins deserved. And that means I go free. Number five, Judah's offering of himself as a substitute for Benjamin points to something much bigger. 
this big story. Listen to how John Lennox expresses it. This big story involves not Judah personally, but his descendant, the Lion of Judah, the promised seed, the Messiah. Judah had the seed, but he wasn't the seed. He was just transmitting the seed until it got all the way to the serpent crusher, Jesus, our Lord, who did give himself as a perfect substitute in dying for sinful men and women so that they could be, listen to the word, reconciled. And when they're reconciled with the Father, suddenly they have the ability to be reconciled with one another. The theological lesson, we are all sinners. This means we have only two options, two and only two. Either we will bear our sins and pay their penalties, or we must find someone else who can. What an amazing story. Now, next week, we're going to talk about forgiveness. Because if there's been guilt, conviction of sin, if there's been confession, Lord, I agree with your assessment of my behavior. If there's been, thirdly, repentance, and Lord, with your help, I'm going to change. I'm going to think differently, live differently, behave differently. And fourthly, if we've found a substitute, then forgiveness becomes possible. And if forgiveness is possible, reconciliation becomes a reality. The family is united again. I want to close. You see on the next page there, under the questions for discussion, the prayer of confession. Many of us, when we go to public worship, if we are given the opportunity to confess very often confession is very generic and vague. Lord, you know I'm not what I ought to be. Lord, I need to modify some of my behaviors. Lord, there's some relational handicaps that I live with. I'd like to target holiness as a growth area. Do you hear the vague inanities that are so often a part of worship? I love to go back to the old language of the Book of Common Prayer, the 16th century. Let me just lead us in prayer as we confess our sins. I love the power, the candor, the reality of words like these. And with these words, I'll close our time together as we confess our sins. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. You come back next week, we're going to talk about what the merciful Father does when he hears a prayer like that. He forgives. We're going to talk about what it looks like and how it happens. God bless you. We'll see you next week.